four realized beings kartikeya he decided anything that he sees as injustice he will destroy wherever he saw injustice he start slaughtering people whichever king whichever leader wherever anybody he sees some injustice slaughter them gurjeev he was a wacky wacky master he took a glass of wine and poured it on a lady and everybody was furious people want to beat him up but aspinski is protecting him the man is enlightened <laughs> jesus when he was born for whatever reasons somebody noticed something some possibility about him at the age of 12 he disappears and 12 is always the time of initiation in india but definitely the boy who left and the man who came back are very different people nirmalananda he said uh, now i am 72 years of age 73 i want to leave He said, I, "I want to die as a yogi, not as a rogi, but I don't know what to do." Then we got into some intricate detail of what he needs to do. Watch Realized Being, a four-part series, only on Sadguru Exclusive. शिवनागे बंधन योगेश्वर शिवनागे बंधन भूतेश्वर शिवनागे बंधन कालेश्वर शिवनागे बंधन जगदीश्वर वंदन माधेवा बहुपिया कंडानो कंडानो ईजीविया कंडानो कंडानो जीविया जीव वे उन्धानो शिव रूपिया तंदानो तंदानो ृता तंदानो तंदानो ज्ञानृता तंदानो तंदानो ज्ञानृता
Karam Dharma, all of you who are here in this weather <laughs> and to every one of you wherever you are. <clears throat> well, coming towards the end of the year, but uh, unfortunately, United States. Uh, is going from bad to worse with the virus. Over three thousand people per day, mortality. Well, it's bigger than… in one day, I'm saying, it's bigger than the so-called great tragedies uh, that occurred in this country in the form of uh, Pearl Harbor or 9-11, they were below three thousand. This is taking over three thousand people per day. Well, there is probably vaccine from today on that everyone must understand. The vaccine is fine, it will definitely make a few things better. But it's not a magic wand. There is no substitute for a conscious, responsible behavior. There is simply no substitute. Well, still there are campaigns going on in the country 
as to how it is all uh, a fake campaign by certain media. Please, it's time you come to your senses. How many people have lost their dear ones? How many people have lost their livelihoods? How many people lives in big turmoil and you still think uh, it is a campaign by somebody? I hope… Uh, I think the virus has got in your brain long time ago. Please come to your senses because what you do, how you breathe, how you behave, how you speak to people is going to determine whether they live or die or maybe yourself, who knows. The question is not to create panic, the intent is not to create some paranoia. Why is a few months of responsible behavior so difficult? This need not have lasted one full year. If every human being on the planet cooperated, it need not have lasted this long. But waves and waves are coming back because uh, human beings are yet to qualify as beings, still behaving like creatures. A being means one who knows how to be. If we knew how to be, a virus is not an issue, it's another life. Who knows? Who knows? This is not to ridicule the situation, but who knows? The virus may lead to some significant evolutionary process within you and you may grow a halo around your head or something, you know. <laughs> it's happened in the past, I'm saying. Not a halo, but more important things happened. They say human placenta, which is vital for our development in our mother's wombs, happened uh, some hundred million years ago because of virus infection. So we have benefited in the past. Hope some great benefit will come out of it, but the greatest benefit that can happen right now which we can effectively bring about in human societies is… human societies is that we can become a conscious, responsible generation. This is the greatest benefit that we can bring about and in turn a halo may appear. <laughs> yes <laughs> This is a, a month which is known as Margali in the southern Indian culture because certain things are recognized in certain cultures where they follow a calendar system which we call as lunisolar calendar, that means both the cycles of the moon and the cycles of the sun are taken into account to make the year. It does not go entirely according to the number system of mm, modern calendar that we are using right now. I'm calling it a number system. It's because uh, everything is set as it's made easy to count for you, that's all. But a calendar must have a relationship with the celestial movements of what relates to this planet. Well, modern calendar has, not that it doesn't, they have corrections and stuff to relate to it, but still it doesn't make you aware of what's happening today. Modern calendar has no mention of a full moon or a new moon which has a significant impact on both human physiology and psychological framework and the glandular secretions in the body are significantly different according to this, according to the cycles of the moon. And the glandular secretions, as all of us know today, 
at least uh, intellectually, is uh, in many ways regulating, uh, well in modern psychological terms, they are in many ways regulators of the body at various levels and particularly of your moods. If you still have moods, good moods and bad moods, that means you're still a creature. That means you don't know how to be. So, if you are uh, still available to these processes, then Margali has a certain significance because this is considered very dear to Shiva because it comes closest to stillness. Life becomes reasonably still compared to the effervescence throughout the year. It comes to kind of a restful state. It is the sleeping time for the northern hemisphere of the planet. You woke up very early today, those of you who are here. <laughs> I shouldn't be using these words, sleeping time. <laughs> but I believe the, the bite of the cold will not let you sleep, I think so. Hello? It's not uh, just, I think it's just about two degrees right now. So it won't freeze you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my hands, my tips of my fingers saying it's around two, three degrees. <laughs> I've not looked at the barometer but <laughs> my fingertips are saying it must be around two to three degrees centigrade, I mean. <clears throat> the rest of the world made uh, temperature and other things easy to read. America is still following a difficult system. <laughs> Thirty-two degrees is zero. <laughs> How? Don't ask me. I don't… I don't know, I just said <laughs> So this month of Margali, many things are done to see that this becomes a restful state, not a depressive state. Because being in a restful state, becoming lethargic, becoming depressive or progressions of the same thing. You rest because you understand rest is the basis of all activity. How well rested this is will determine how dynamically active this can be. If you don't get the needed rest, this will become hyper and collapse. It is important that it's restful. but. If you make rest into your philosophy <laughs> now some people make rest into your philosophy. Rest is a requirement, like food is a requirement, but some people have made food into a philosophy. Some have elevated it to the status of religion. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm thinking of becoming a chef. Because I find if I say the most profound things, how many people are excited about it? And if I just talk about food, whoa, <laughs> global response. <laughs> so I was just thinking maybe it's time we change our activity from <laughs> initiations and meditation and kriyas and yoga, <laughs> cooking and eating, <laughs> very easy <laughs> So if you make rest into your philosophy, it will become lethargy. 
if you establish yourself, if you graduate in your lethargy, you will slowly become depressive. So let's not go there. This is a time of restfulness for the planet, or at least the northern part of the planet, because of various… find out, okay? Today there is your wise aunt from California. You can ask her and find out what exactly is happening in terms of planet's relationship with the rest of the solar system, but it is happening. Everything slows down. Rest. Don't make it a philosophy of lethargy or don't move into depressions. I'm saying this repeatedly because I hear millions of people across the world, particularly in temperate climates, become depressed. During winter times, the highest incidence of depression across the world, particularly in temperate climates, because it's cold and they can't go out. I think this year you may not because already you have gotten used to not going out <laughs> You acclimatized for Margali Masam <laughs> You need to understand, this is the month of Shiva, it's dearest to him because uh, world is kind of, uh, you know, uh, acting like it's inspired by him just simply just blown away. So it's time to make yourself very alert, but physically less active. If you want to enjoy, if you want to really enjoy stillness, you must be super alert, otherwise stillness will feel like death. In death everybody becomes still, but that's not… Of no, that's of no value. You have become inanimate in a way. So becoming inanimate and becoming still is not great. Becoming super alert but still, tremendous things will happen. Well, these things are not planned, don't blame it on me. Uh, it is just that we are also coming towards the eleventh anniversary of uh, Bhairavi consecration, ideal time. Oh. See, this is what I was afraid of. I told you, at the time of consecration, I fear this, that slowly you guys will become fans of Bhairavi because she's a kind of a star. And you'll start ignoring Shiva. I said, Shiva, you said nothing. <laughs> Bhairavi, <Bye, Ooh! laughs> This is what I expressed eleven years ago. <laughs> I fear she will become more popular because uh, there is a little give and take with her. With him, no give, no take. Because you still have a mind which questions anything that you do, what is the use? First thing you must ask the question, what is the use of you being alive? What is the use of you being born? So all you will come to with the silly logic of the mind is no use to be or not to be. So, for a logical mind, in many ways, Bhairavi is more appealing because there is a little transaction. So this is eleventh year and you know her uh, phone number is eleven. Hello? You… I think you came on triple one, right, just now <laughs> to triple I <laughs> Whichever way you came, if you came from Nashville, you exited on triple one. If you came from Atlanta, you drove on highway triple one. 
Anyway, <laughs> and this is the eleventh year where uh, we are opening up certain possibilities of sadhana. Till now, uh, Devi sadhana or Bhairavi sadhana was available only for women. This year they are losing that privilege. <laughs> Men also are getting into Devi sadhana. <laughs> This is popular. Hmm? <laughs> what is the significance of the feminine as a dimension? Well, uh, you were given birth by a feminine entity. Because the initial transactions was very sweet, she was like a goddess, your mother I'm talking about. But later on transactions got a little <laughs> So, she came down from the status of being goddess to just another human being, nice, loving maybe, but just another human being. And when she transformed herse herself into a mother-in-law, <laughs> then she went down, <laughs> deep down. <laughs> See, people forgot that she's still a mother, in-law of course, but… <laughs> but more feared than the outlaw. Not necessarily because of her qualities, her inability to transform in law, because she's still a mother for one person. And the other doesn't accept her as a mother. And it goes on, you know the traditional thing, this happened. One Shankaran Pillai lost his mother-in-law. So he went to his lawyer to settle a few things of property and stuff, legal aspects. So he told him, my mother-in-law passed away last week. The lawyer asked, oh, is that so? I'm sorry, what was the complaint? Shankaran Pillai said, no complaint, all are satisfied. So from being a goddess, she became just a mother, later on in her life she became a mother-in-law and she doesn't know what hits her. Why someone who was so sweet and loved, loved by everybody suddenly has become a point of problem. Every problem is directed towards her. One third of the jokes on the planet are about her. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> She still doesn't realize what happened. It is just that she is still a mother, not able to become in-law. I'm not saying a mother is out of the law, but she is actually out of the law. She doesn't go by any principle of the world. She goes by her love for what she considers as hers. <laughs> so this love for what you consider as mine, doesn't… does not conform to any law, so she remains an outlaw. This is the nature of love, that it does not conform to any law. Someone went to the extent of saying, uh, both in love and war, everything is fine, that means Love is essentially an outlaw matter because it does not conform to logical straight lines that you have drawn. Law is good to drive on the street, you drive on this lane, I drive on that lane. But uh, 
Love means you want to crash into each other, hello? Don't do that on the street, okay? <laughs> so, uh, the good thing about Bhairavi is, uh, see, none of the goddesses had children. So they remain goddesses, they were not brought down. lot of women are learning these ways these days. They know if they don't have children, they will… they can act like a goddess with their spouse. If they have children, they will become mothers and after a few years, they will become in-laws and outlaws. <laughs> For one person in-law, another person outlaw. <laughs> so what is the significance of this worship of the feminine. One important thing that you need to understand is, feminine is not a gender, it is a dimension. If I utter the word feminine, you are thinking of a gender. No, it is not a gender, it is a certain dimension of life. The significance of this dimension is, it's easier to get response from this dimension, then the other dimension that we consider as masculine, because it is designed in a different way. It's not about which is better than which, there's no such thing. It's just different. A fool can start an argument, which is better than which? This is like, is the earth better or sky better? Those who are upon the earth or the planet are looking up at the sky. You know, I spent a long time watching the eagles and hawks, the grey hawks in India. I spent a special amount of time in my life watching them because of the incredible way they can fly. And uh, from eight, nine years of age, I was dreaming of flying. <laughs> so I watched and watched and watched. And what I found was, all these glorious flying creatures who are such, uh, you know, I don't want to go into the detail, but you must look it up. Some of these hawks, their capabilities of flying is uh, way better than a fighter jet. I'm not saying it goes as fast, but for… for the body it has, for the volume it has, what it does with its wings and its body is so absolutely incredible. But as I watched them, fascinated by their flight, I only looked at their wings and their tail, how it moves, what the feathers are doing. Then I noticed all these birds which are flowing, flying up there, in our view, a glorious flight. The only thing that they're doing is constantly looking down at the earth. Have you noticed this? They're never looking at the sky and enjoying it. They're only looking down at the earth all the time. Of course, for food or just because they enjoy the planet Earth the way it looks. But human beings who cannot fly are looking up all the time. So then I thought through this and just thinking, isn't it better that you're a chicken and you're looking up at the sky rather than being an eagle looking down all the time? Because one who looks up naturally rises, one who looks down naturally come down. One is at least aspirational. Another is uh, wanting to go down. So feminine is a dimension, not a gender. There are uh, fantastic examples, me also, 
a living example of that, but I don't like to put myself in that direction because of all these Bhairavi fans who are here, they'll all go berserk. <laughs> but let me tell you of ancient examples. One more recent example is Ramanujam. All of you have heard of him, a mathematician. There was also a movie about him a few years ago of how Ramanujam poured out mathematics, very complex mathematical formulae, to a point where in early twentieth century when there was no concept of black holes, he kind of created mathematics describing black holes. Always in scientific process or scientific uh, research, first is a theory, uh, a conceptualization of what it could be, and then trying to prove it with either empirical proof if that is possible, for but for other aspects, mathematical proof. But he produced math before there was a concept. Even today, it's being figured out what exactly is all this about. But he just poured out mathematics. When people asked him, where is this coming from? Simply notebooks and notebooks of math he just poured out. Sitting on his deathbed, he died very early, unfortunately. He said, my Devi, my goddess, bleeds mathematics. There's another more colorful example. His name was Kalidasa, that means a slave of Kali, a devotee of Kali, let's say. Somewhere twenty-five centuries ago, Kalidasa, during the time of uh, Chandragupta, Maurya, I think, or even before that, a little before that probably. <clears throat> Was… Uh, the story goes like this. You know, stories get little… get little extra frills on the way, but the important thing is what it's trying to say. Not the factuality of the story, but the spirit of the story. So for many lifetimes, Kalidasa was a great devotee of Kali. So in his previous lifetime, he was deeply disappointed that in spite of all his devotion, she did not appear. She did nothing for him. So he died little disappointed with her. After all these lifetimes of wooing, she doesn't respond. So in his present life, where his name was something else, we don't know what his name was, he was born as a little bit of a simpleton. When he was a grown man, he had the mind of uh, an eight-year-old, So generally, when you're eight years for who you are, people think you are cute. When you become eighteen and still remain the same way, they say you're a bloody fool. Hello? <laughs> yes or no? <laughs> so this happened to him, everybody thought he's a village fool. And the king of the local king who was there, he had a daughter who considered herself very intelligent. Maybe she was. And uh, she wanted to marry an intelligent man. And ladies, you know it's hard to find one. <laughs> because if he, was, if he was that smart, why would he marry you? See, a joke is a double-edged sword, okay <laughs> So whoever came to marry her, many from many kingdoms, because she can only marry a prince, 
many of them came and she rejected all of them as fools. He said, they're not fit for me. After not only rejecting these suitors, also insulting them as fools, slowly many kings around this small kingdom became the enemies of this kingdom because they were not only refused, they were called fools by this girl. So the father of facing political and military pressure from all around, he got so mad with the girl and he said, you idiot, the thing is, I must get you married to the worst fool in our kingdom. Only then you will learn your lesson. So he scolded her nicely and told his men to go and find who is the dumbest idiot in our kingdom. Find that guy, I want him to marry my daughter. So they went looking uh, here and there. Then they saw in this village, a young man was sitting on the wrong side of the branch and was cutting the branch. <laughs> like how we as a generation of people are doing ecologically. You know, we belong to that category, all of us. They saw… they saw, this can't be any more stupid than this, he's cutting the branch on which he's sitting and when he succeeds, he will fail <laughs> Right now, that's where we as a generation are, when we succeed, we will fall. Our idea of success is right now so destructive. So anyway, they caught this guy and took him and said, this guy… this… there can't be a worse fool than this. So, he is fit to marry the princess. They got them married forcefully. But the girl took it out on him, every day, every moment insulting him in thousand different ways, reviling him in many ways possible. After a few months, even this guy who was very simple-minded, even he felt very insulted because uh, she had a sharp tongue. It's been masked these days, but <laughs> So one day he left the palace and went away into the forest just to escape the sharpness of her tongue. Then there was an old Kali temple in the forest. Usually Kali temples are deep in the jungles because uh, the rituals are of a certain kind which society may not uh, be willing to swallow. The normal society may not be able to digest the type of rituals that happen in the Kali temples many times. So, uh, always deep in the jungles. So he went into the Kali temple, you know, to escape one woman he has to go <laughs> to another. He went and put his head at her feet and started banging his head, not knowing any prayer or mantra or chant or anything, he just started banging his head at her feet and his head started bleeding as drops of blood fell on her feet. He had locked himself because he was afraid soldiers will come find him and again take him back to his wife. <laughs> then he heard a voice from outside and it said, I'm Kali, I've come, open the door. By now he was so furious, he said, for these lifetimes you did not come. He remembered everything suddenly, he said, for these lifetimes I prayed, I chanted, I worshipped, you did not come. Now what the hell have you come? I'm not going to open the door. Then Kali repeatedly called him, please open the door. Then just to taunt her, because he's still an eight-year-old boy, he opened the door a crack and put his tongue out toward her. <laughs> and she struck his tongue. And one who was considered uh, 
the kingdom's most profound fool, suddenly becomes a great scholar who... This is something that's attributed to Kalidasa. Kalidasa is considered in India as in terms of literature and poetry greater than Shakespeare. They compare... comparative studies of Kalidasa and Shakespeare exists in India and many, many scholars rate him as way above in his language, in his mastery of language, in his understanding and how he expressed himself. Very little of his work is left, unfortunately, but in spite of that, that little work is of phenomenal quality. So suddenly he started composing poetry and literature. Uh, just like that, he could sit in a place and simply recite poetry, not written, simply like that. So his tongue became of such exuberance of quality that he could just recite new verses just like that. So because Kali struck his tongue, now that you are masked, Bhairavi may not be able to strike your tongue, maybe she knocks... I hope she knocks you on your head. Hello? So, uh, these are little magnified stories, but it is not out of sync with what can happen. One who attains to the grace of the Devi, whatever you're doing in your life, you may be a business person, you may be a professional in something, you may be an artist, a musician, a yogi, whatever you are. If you want to pitch up your activity to another dimension of, you know, doing things, you need Devi's grace. One who is touched by this grace will naturally rise in ways that other people will think is miraculous. This has happened to many people, I must tell you this. There have been significant men in the world, I don't want to name them now because it is politically sensitive. Significant men, just look up history, in the last two centuries, who were nurtured by their mothers and uh, in some way in their perception, the mother remained like a goddess, she did not come down to become a loving mother. She remained a goddess, goddess being hard on the child. Many men are there in the world in the last two centuries who have risen to great heights in whatever they were doing because in some way they were in feminine worship. Because articulation, and when I say articulation, not just verbal articulation, articulation essentially means you're able to find expression. If you want to find expression in the world, you need Devi's grace. Whether you do it by chanting a mantra, whether you do it by going to a temple, or whether you do it by acknowledging that dimension within yourself, or whether you do it by looking up to something that is feminine or simply by being in nature. It doesn't matter how you do it, but that dimension that we refer to as feminine, when it yields to you, your articulation or your expression in the world will find tremendous enhancement. This is the eleventh year, this is why we are opening this up for men also, the Bhairavi Sadhana. Because uh, as... Uh, as all married men at least have realized, definitely women are more articulate than you, <laughs> at least in the domestic situations. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so, after this eleventh uh, year association with the Devi, you could become equally or more articulate than her and the scene at home will change. Significantly, this happened. 
One day Shankaran Pillai was in bed. It was already 2 a.m. He was rolling and turning around, twist twisting and tossing and saying, This is an Indian way of expressing frustration. <laughs> you know, even love, anger, frustration, depression, everything has cultural expressions, hello? <laughs> Indian way of saying I'm frustrated is <laughs> So his wife, who was lying next to him and she also couldn't sleep because he was turning and tossing like this. She said, what is the matter with you? It's two o'clock in the morning. He said, see, our neighbor Jake, you know, I owe him thousand dollars. And I told him that tomorrow morning I will give it to him. But I cannot give it to him. She asked, why? He said, I don't have it. She looked at him in a disgusting way, no sound, okay? She just got up, went to the window, opened the window and screamed, Jake! Jake! Loudly, Jake! 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 In the middle of the night, Jake opened the door, window and said, what, Mrs. Pillai, what happened? The thousand dollars that my husband owes to you, he's not going to give it to you tomorrow because he ain't got it. <laughs> she banged the window closed and came and slept. She said, you sleep, now it's Jake's problem <laughs> Feminine ways of solving problems, sometimes useful <laughs> So, especially with the pandemic on, uh, you will need uh, a, s a certain type of intelligence, otherwise you'll become depressed. That's okay, Sadhguru, but I've lost my job. You need uh, a certain kind of function of intelligence for you to go through this phase. Because this phase is not going to be just over because they released the vaccine today or tomorrow. They would have released it today, but Sunday nobody works, so it must be tomorrow. <laughs> Virus works though. <laughs> so, that's not going to be a magic wand for you. You will need your own magic wand of intelligence where you will learn to thrive through these times, important. It's very important for you, for your physical well-being, for your professional, financial, social well-being. You must learn how to survive in times where you have to put your head down and walk. Hello? When you're walking like this, it's one way of attaining success. When you walk down like this, another way of success, another me uh, completely different measures for success are needed. So, the coming year, virus may still be there. Let's not suffer the virus. Let us uh, earn the grace of Bhairavi. And this is uh, Shiva's month. Hey! <laughs>